Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for the patience. Sorry to start a few minutes late. Uh, my name is Ryan Cunningham. I lead the uh, Power Apps product team. I um, have some folks here with me from uh, the, the whole Power platform. We've got uh, Chris from the Power Automate team, Pear from our admin and developer team, uh, and I think we'll be joined by uh, my, my fellow Ryan in crime from the CDS team as well. Um, so happy to start going through questions in uh, the chat. Please, uh, please add them as you have a chance. Um, Pear, Chris, do you guys want to chime in and, and say hi for a second? Yeah, hey, this is Chris Gardy uh, from the not. <laughs> Power Automate team. Uh, I've been with the team uh, about four months or something like that. Um, I was previously on the finance and operations team, so I've got kind of a lot of knowledge on the business application side. So I'll be happy to answer questions related to that. Awesome. Here, here. Uh, very pleased to be here. I always love these sessions where we get uh, get on the <laughs> all the questions that we want and that we also want to learn from, but we also want to help you. So as Ryan said, um, I'm heading up the Pro and ISB experience team on the Power Platform. So I'm all about um, enabling Pro developers to dance with the citizen developers, as well as uh, enabling ISVs to publish fantastic apps on App Source. So pleased to be here tonight. Awesome. Um, all right, I'm trying to do a video jockey here on our on our faces, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Uh, we'll do it real informal. Um, so let's go down the list. We've got some good questions coming in. Uh, the first one, uh, this is uh, this is a really good one and a, and a pretty straightforward one. What's the best place to start on Power Platform? Is there is there training material from Microsoft? Um, there's loads of it, and we do a great job at squirreling it away and hiding it in all the far corners of the internet. Um, but uh, but I think we, we can go through and, and share some of our, our top resources here. I'm actually going to uh, reply in the chat uh, with one great uh, jump link. It is aka.ms slash power platform resources. Um, and that is my favorite kind of go-to starting point. Um, for a whole bunch of different uh, jump off points. If you go scroll through that, it's literally just a blog post, but it uh, it will go into categories. Hey, I'm a developer, I'm an admin, I'm a citizen just trying to get started. I want to read about customer stories, I want to read about governance, and it's a good sort of air traffic control to get you started in a lot of places. Um, some of the big hubs for learning content uh, are uh, obviously docs.microsoft.com uh, for raw documentation. Uh, we also have some of the most popular modules on Microsoft Learn um, and uh, and you know some good kind of end-to-end journeys there. If you want to get your feet wet a, a, a little bit uh, more deeply, we have a whole series of uh, a blank in a day programs. It starts with app in a day, uh, Power Automate or Flow in a day, admin in a day um, and uh, and actually have different tracks within the tune to different sophistication levels um, and so you can start to, to really sit down that's something that we publish all the curriculum for uh, sort of open source you can take yourself through it and, and literally in a day go build things and uh, and, and come out the other side uh, you know having built an out automation and an app um, but we also have a whole range of partners around the planet that can go deliver that as a, a proctored session and now a virtually uh, proctored session uh, which is a great way to, uh, to to get the experience as well. Um, so yeah, any, I don't know, uh, Pear or Chris, if you want to share any other uh, good uh, uh, getting started nuggets <laughs> for people. New you know, that, <laughs> you're yeah. pointing to to my go-to as well. It's a it's a great, great, great place to get place to get started. And once you go in there, you're also gonna find pointers to to all kinds of other wonderful stuff. So no, nothing, nothing to add there. It's it's a great place to get started. Cool. Yeah, learn uh, would be my number one, and then in addition, in addition to learn, also the uh, like the Power Apps community uh, forums. So I jump on the community forums and uh, check any any um, yeah information that you can find there. But learn certainly has uh, some really good kind of paths that you can follow um, to to learn about different topics. That's true. We got the learning paths in there now. It's actually it's it's quite addictive. I I I, yeah. I started playing with that the other the other night. Uh, couldn't sleep and I just started walking down this learning path. And it was um, I learned something as well. So yeah, that's actually <laughs> believe it or not, Ryan. I can I can learn things. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's a it's a good. I will resource. make no wisecracks about that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. 
um, that's awesome. No, the, and the community is a great uh, spot. I guess the one other uh, to to throw out there is there's actually something like 750 independent local user groups in in cities around the world. Um, uh, you know, and they're thriving everywhere from Joburg to uh, to London and uh, and and all points in between. Um, also adapting on how to be virtual and remote, most of them in our current reality. Uh, but those are great places to connect with uh, with like minded folks in your own town um, and, uh, and and learn a lot that way, too. Um, cool. Uh, next question on here is uh, when will when will feature parity between classic and unified interface designers be reached? Um, uh, this is a this is a good question. I guess this one is probably aimed squarely at me, <laughs> so I'll take it. Um, uh, you know, parity is a is a is a uh, is a is a, is a, a, a tough concept and a lofty goal. And in a lot of cases, we're actually not trying to just pixel for pixel and button for button migrate everything from the legacy Dynamics 365 authoring stack into the into the modern world. We're trying to be thoughtful about it. Um, as we as we go modernize those things and bring them forward. Um, and we've started with the pieces that are by far most commonly used and most impactful. We've literally gone by, you know, what do people use the most and, and making sure that we're starting to bring those experiences over and also monitoring really closely how many people are successful on those modern experiences without switching back um, before we sort of declare victory and move on to other ones. Um, so for, for those of you who are familiar and maybe have a background in uh, Dynamics 365 customization that you know has, has been around for a long time. <laughs> you know we've recently gone and, and modernized a lot of those experiences at make.powerapps.com, and we've, we've the entity editing experience, the form design experience, the uh, uh, you know the the view design experience, a lot of things like that. Um, and and we're just churning down that list as we go and bringing new things in. Um, I would say we're still probably a couple releases out from really being able to fully sunset and move away from the complete legacy stack. We will leave a few things behind when we do, not uh, capabilities, but um, but really the interfaces maybe as we knew them in the in the first place. Um, for those of you who are using both, uh, we have uh, we have some uh, uh, some easy ways to switch back to classic now from modern. And you'll notice recently when you do that, you're actually prompted with a little box that says, "Hey, tell us why you're switching back." Um, I cannot tell you how invaluable that is. <laughs> Literally just last week, I read through every single piece of feedback that people have submitted there personally um, and uh, and took stock of, uh, of where we're at uh, in a lot of those journeys. And, and we're trying to be just very customer driven in how we go modernize. Um, so keep the feedback coming, uh, keep uh, keep tinkering um, and uh, and we'll go from there. Um, you know, I will say a significant chunk of makers are now living exclusively in the modern experiences, um, and those makers who are building on uh, CDS in the modern experiences exclusively tend to actually be happier than the average maker. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of people who have, uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, pathways or even certain dependencies on the legacy stuff and aren't able to fully migrate over yet, and uh, and and we're we're watching that closely. Cool. Um, what's next here? Uh, Server-side architecture overhauled at any point to allow for plug-in workflow development in .NET Core and .NET 5. Um, I don't know if, if Brian Jones was able to join the call. Pair, is that one you feel uh, comfortable yeah, taking? Yeah, I can. I can. I I can provide just a little little bit of light on it. So we are actually working on all that, um, and we even have some of those bits out in preview now. I'm going to add just a, a link to an announcement on that specific note. I think that was Matt Barber um, who sent that out. So yes, it is certainly stuff that we're actually working on. Um, it does not support plugin development just yet, but this article will give you the, the full overview of what we support now. But for sure, we are, we are pursuing yeah. this now for a number of different reasons. Um, so yes, we will be supporting it we're working on it and we will get there. Um, uh, one of the pieces that we got on this as well, another piece that 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 we have to get to is things like supporting or building out um, GitHub Actions so that we could eventually both support um, Azure DevOps tasks as well as GitHub Actions. And that is one of the uh, one of the pieces that we got and got to get in place before we can do that. So yes, there are all kinds of interest in us to getting getting to that as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
Next question on the list is, uh, is the Dynamics portal no more? Uh, if we had a Dynamics portal, should we upgrade it to the new Power Apps portal? Um, uh, the, the dirty secret here is that the Power Apps portal is the Dynamics portal. <laughs> from all intents and purposes, from a technology perspective, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, the, the changes are, are a couple. One, we, we went in and made sure that there was not a hard dependency on being in a Dynamics environment to go create one. So I can go build one over a raw CDS environment that has no Dynamics in it. Um, and then obviously we went in and we invested in a more modern and low code maker experience um, that feels more like Power Apps and is, and is visual and, and drag and drop. Um, and, and those are the two main changes. The other important change is really how you pay for it. Uh, you know, it used to be only available to people who have, were already buying Dynamics um, and really sold on sort of a flat rate per portal, um, uh, which uh, which was, you know, OK in some situations, but also meant if I wanted a dev prod, a dev test prod portal, I was paying the same amount for every single uh, instance that was not uh, production. Um, so that has shifted to a model where uh, you pay basically for usage. You buy a capacity of login events or anonymous page views, um, and it gets debited against uh, actual usage every month. Um, so uh, one common misconception about that as well also is uh, what it really costs. Um, there are significant tiers of discount for volume as it goes up, and those are publicly documented in uh, in some of our uh, deeper and, uh, and, and more intense pricing documentation documents. Uh, but those are the big changes. Otherwise, the portal you're already running is, is the same portal. It's all the same tech under the hood. None of that has changed. Um, what you upgrade to is basically to be able to to switch to the capacity-based licensing for the portal, um, and then you're you're able to to use it in environments that don't don't have dynamics behind it. But there's no there's no impending migration or or prod regression uh, or anything like that to worry about on the tech. It's the same stack. Um, hopefully that's clarifying. All right, um, when will we get testing debugging capabilities in Power Automate? Um, Chris, that sounds like one for, for you. So there, there is some debugging and testing capabilities. I'm not aware of anything uh, new related to that. Um, yeah, I guess I don't have a, a super good answer on that. Um, there, I mean, when you, <clears throat> when you do the runs in Power Automate, you can see all of the how how the flow is running through. You can see all of the data that's sent into each action block, um, the data that's coming out of the triggers. Um, you can see all of those runs. Uh, you can play back um, uh, through, you can play data back through a, a Power Automate um, flow. Um, so any, any kind of previous flow run that had data coming in from the trigger that you're interested in debugging, you can run that through a new version of the flow. Um, you can tweak the flow as needed and then run through it again uh, and see how it responds. Um, so there's there's all of those capabilities. Aside from those capabilities that are already there, I'm not uh, aware of anything that we're adding in that space. Um, but certainly if you have kind of targeted needs, um, certainly put that in the Q&A and maybe I can address that later on. All right. Um, looks like we've got another one here. Will Will you be adding version control to Power Automate, similar to what exists for, for Power Apps? Yeah, this is a question that I'm going to have to go and uh, learn about. I'm. Can you talk about the version control that's available for Power Apps, uh, Ryan? Is it just using solutions? Because all of the solutions capabilities are fully available for Power Automate, and certainly that's the thing that jumps to mind as far as uh, version control is concerned. That is the thing that we recommend um, is putting flows into solutions, uh, organizing them into solutions, um, having different versions of your flows uh, organized into solutions. Um, and and being able to deploy uh, your solutions to kind of test and sandbox and then and then eventually to prod. But maybe Ryan, do you have thoughts on Power Apps as far as solutions and versioning is concerned? 
So, so Pear is our is our ALM guru, and oh, yeah, I'll put him on the spot there as well. But, but <laughs> um, at, at a high level, uh, yes, the solutioning system that that sits under uh, everything on CDS and around Power Platform is sort of the primary way to go manage lifecycle and and versions in Power Apps, particularly Canvas apps. We do just direct in the mainline maker portal, make it really easy to go roll back to a previous version of an individual asset. Um, and that's something that is uh, is is unique to Canvas apps today in, in the platform. That's great for sort of in place rollback of version if I'm in one environment and, uh, and I'm just rolling back the app itself. Um, the benefit of using a solutioning system is I can bind together all the dependencies of that application um, and and do some uh, some more sophisticated operations across environments as well. Uh, but I don't know, Pear, if you have more to to add to that from a from a pro dev perspective. No, there is there is there is kind of the concept that we have in the solutioning, right? That I version think of it as I'm I'm versioning my solutions, and that that yeah. define the version of my application, right? Um, but when you start implementing um, a more source control centric approach to this, right? You're gonna have your 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 application secured in source control, and you're gonna have all the version capabilities that you have there. So you kind of like have have two ways. Ways of thinking around uh, thinking about versioning, right? Um, while while I'm on while I'm on stage here, we actually we had um, Ryan Jones was trying to join. We had we had a little technical glitch, so I think he's still trying to get in. But he was yeah. he, he asked me to emphasize just going back to the .NET Core <laughs> question yeah. that we're not we're not changing the uh, the server runtime. That's not that's not what we're doing. I, I just want to make that clear. But again, the details are in are in the um, in the blog that that I, that I shared previously. Good call. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there a way where a Power Automate process is linked to a team role instead of a Microsoft account? Um, I'm gonna put you back on the spot again, Chris. I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. Yeah, sure. So this is actually a topic that we've been uh, looking at uh, internally. So today, Flows must be run as a user. Um, so it's a fairly quick answer on that one. Um, <clears throat> in the future, we're looking at making it so that flows can run kind of as, as a service account, um, but that's something that we're kind of just talking about internally, uh, just starting to work on. Um, so you can look at that, look for that kind of in the release plan, probably for kind of wave one uh, 2021 um, if it shows up there. Cool. Um, all right, let's add some more to our queue here. We've got, oh, I just lost my question view. We've got a bunch of questions queued up that we've got to keep up with here. Um, here's one that's related. When will flows and Canvas apps be automatically deployable? Perry, do you want to grab that one? Um, when will they be automatically deployable? I guess I'd be delighted to grab it. So, uh, <laughs> reality is that they are, they are, and bear with me here, they are automatically deployable today, um, but they don't always um, function very well in the target environment that they're deployed to for a number of different reasons. Um, so, we're introducing something. Um, something called connection references and we're introducing something called um, environment variables that mm -hmm. when they enable you to better bind those in the target environment because the challenge right now is when you deploy something and you might be using a you, you're building a, a, a canvas app or you have a, a flow from power automate and it's using a connector or several different connectors and custom connectors um, we don't have a very elegant way to resolve those in the target environment um, so we're working on enabling that in the solutioning system so that's that's going to be rolled out here this summer i think already in june a lot of that work is going to start to land so you're going to see a lot healthier um automatable deployments this summer coming coming near you so we are aware of the issues there and i'll I, I'll, I'll add a um I'll add a link to some of the known limitations that we have now, but rest assured that we're working uh, through all those known limitations as well. So I'll add that and, and we'll keep posting every time we make those improvements. Awesome. Um, all right, we got a couple more that we're rolling out of the uh, unpublished queue into the published queue here. 
Um, I think the next one on the list is um, how does licensing work if we have a customer facing mobile Xamarin app that reads and writes data to CDS? Um, Man, I wish we would have gotten Brian Jones into the uh, <laughs> into the meeting. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, in tip, according to the licensing guide, every user of uh, of uh, the CDS app, you know, data source needs a license to to use CDS. Um, and uh, and there's you know, technically being able to go end run that first party licensing system is uh, is is multiplexing. <laughs> um, and uh, and and not only that, I need an authenticated context to use CDS as well. Um, uh, now, in in practice, I think people achieve that a few different ways today. Um, uh, you know, if I purely only have that custom endpoint um, uh, to you know front end to CDS, and I'm, I'm building only against that, and I have nothing else in the platform. Um, you know, sometimes people model that like they model a portal. Sometimes they attach it to to other systems as well. I think that's really one where you'd you'd want to get a little click deeper into um, who is the user base, how are they authenticated to to use CDS, and what's the rest of their licensing profile like. Um, so that might be one that is a little better to take up uh, up uh, offline. But feel free to reach out to us uh, directly, and we can connect you to the right folks to answer a question like that. Um, any plans for an API or commandlet to automate reading of analytics in the Power Platform admin center, like capacity usage, most active users, et cetera? Um, uh, I'll chime in there a little bit, and then maybe Pear, you can you can jump on top of that as as part of that team. Um, so there are a set of PowerShell commandlets um, for for looking at Power Apps usage, and we can post a link in here to um, uh, to the documentation for those. So so some of this is is doable today, um, uh, and on top of that, we have actually uh, gone a step further. We've written a set of admin connectors where we actually connect. Power Apps, Power BI, and Power Automate to Power Apps, Power BI, and Power Automate um, uh, so that you can use them to manage the service. Uh, and we've even gone further than that, where we've published uh, what we call a Center of Excellence Starter Kit, which is a set of pre-built apps and dashboards and automations that uh, that help with governance and tailoring governance. Um, so there, there is a lot that comes out of the box in the Power Platform Admin Center. We're adding to it every day, but you can go much, much deeper with the capabilities that we expose through those uh, commandlets and connectors and the COE starter kits built on top. Um, if you go look at organizations that have thousands or tens of thousands of applications and automations and tens of thousands of users and thousands of makers um, you know at scale they're really using that full toolkit to go govern and manage proactively that big community of, of low code users inside of the organization um, and there's some great content out there um, that folks like uh, SNCF, the National Railway in France, or Schlumberger um, have shared really publicly about how they manage low code at that big scale. Um, those those center of excellence starter kits are really useful because they go much deeper than just dashboards. Actually, there's a set of apps and, and approval flows to actually interact with makers as they're creating stuff in environments and, and interrupt them and say, hey, fill out this form, tell us what you're doing, um, log that into a CDS instance, and, and and sort of mix that with the telemetry reporting on what people are doing with those apps. Um, so there's just a lot of capability there. Uh, for those of you who are really interested in, in riveting page turning nonfiction, we have a great 112 page admin and governance white paper that goes into blistering detail um, on uh, on all of this stuff and more um, and uh, and is pretty useful as well. So it looks like Pear is, is dropping um, some good uh, uh, documentation links in there. We can add some more. Um, as uh, as we go, anything to add on top of that? No, it, it's I, I think you covered it well. It's I, I think that the short of it is that it's an issue that we're aware of. Like as 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 the platform scales and and it it it, it enters some some very large enterprises, right? The requirements around governments and analytics and what data is being consumed, and where does it go, and what connectors am I connected to? Like that piece has just has grown immensely and is a, is a very high priority. For the entire um, admin team at the moment to light up those those capabilities. Um, so yes, certainly a focus, and and you should already see if you haven't looked into the the Power Platform Admin Center lately on what's actually available there in, in analytics. Um, you should take a look, and you should make a habit of going there to see what we light up, literally on on a on a weekly, if not a daily basis. 
Yeah, we just uh, just basically closed the final remaining gaps between that admin center and some of the individual product admin centers like the Power Apps admin yep. center, the, the Power Automate admin center. You can now do uh, DLP policies natively at, at the Power Platform admin center. We've actually really expanded what you can do there with data loss prevention and improve the UX as well. Yep. So that is now the one admin center to rule them all <laughs> and uh, <laughs> be sort of con collapsing and condensing the others as we go. Um, yeah. over over the coming months. So definitely, definitely a lot there. Look, I'll say at a very high level, uh, this whole thesis does not work without great governance, great control, and great visibility on the part of admins. Uh, and we take that really seriously. And that's why we're investing really heavily in, in that capability, getting that balance right between unblocking citizen development, unblocking professional development, and keeping uh, compliance top of mind for an organization. Uh, but we think it's a, it's a, it's the line to walk to make this work at scale. And we know that's what large organizations who are running this at scale are really thriving on. Um, okay, that was a lot on admin, but it's important. Next uh, question in the list, just going down it is, is when will we be expecting the custom Canvas pages feature of, to be available? Um, can you point more light on this feature? Um, so for those of you who aren't tracking, you know, part of our journey to bring together the more pixel perfect uh, PowerPoint like uh, canvas style of app development with the more, I would say, traditional declarative metadata driven style of development over CDS, which we call model driven. Um, part of that kind of hinges on a making everything a pluggable component. And so if you've been following us, you've seen a lot of our investments in PCF, the PowerApps component framework over the last year, kind of coming to maturity as a common control model across Canvas apps and model apps. Um, that's been you know, really a foundational investment and now we're rolling out all of our modern sort of first party Power Apps controls as PCF controls in that framework um, and rolling them simultaneously to uh, Canvas apps and model apps at the same time. That's that's table stakes. The next big step for us is to start to take the the design paradigm of the canvas. What I can do with you know dragging and dropping controls together, binding them on the fly to any number of data sources, and host that within the model frame. Um, and that's what we call the custom page. Is really the full screen canvas experience that I can bring into the declarative model world um, and have participate in that same navigation and sitemap, but be the whole experience. Um, so that is coming uh, pretty soon. I actually demoed that at our BizApp Summit a couple weeks ago running in code. Um, it is still internal to Microsoft right now, but we'll be opening it up over the next few months um, in progressive rings of, of private and public previews as we as we sort of harden the edges around it. Um, we've been doing a lot of the vegetable eating foundational work, not just to make the control framework work, but also to make that whole packaging story really work together, that whole solutioning story really work together end to end. Uh, but that will unlock a lot of value. You know, today, increasingly, we see people using these capabilities side by side. I've got a great Canvas app for my mobile frontline worker, and it's pumping data into a model app uh, that somebody in the back office is, is watching everything flow through, and that's pumping data out to Power BI for analysis. Um, we'll be able to just start to combine all those into single interfaces where they make sense in, in a lot more seamless way. Um, Okay, uh, when will Power will Power BI and its admin panel be integrated into the Power Platform interfaces? Um, I don't know. Should we ask Ladbrokes uh, pair? Should we uh, <laughs> get any pool going on this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, no. Great ans answers to that one at the moment. Um, there are there are other priorities. Uh, is, is all I can I can say on that. There, there are no no definite plans on that. We'd like it as much as as everyone else, but um, there are many other many other gaps to plug at the moment. Is really all we got on that. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'll say there is, uh, look, we're trying to be really pragmatic about platform convergence. Uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, it is a huge strength and differentiator for Power Platform that we have invested in in all these capabilities, whether it's BI development or bot development or automation or apps. 
you know, this is literally one engineering team rolling up to one VP, James Phillips, and builds it, you know, all in house, and they do integrate with each other in in a much more seamless way than stitching this together from a bunch of point solution vendors that you know don't even work together. And we've seen sort of the market go on an acquisition tear to sort of a, you know compile that same set of capabilities, right? Salesforce is out there buying Tableau, buying MuleSoft, that type of thing. Um, so it's an asset. At the same time, in practice your BI developer and admin traditionally has been very different in focus and need than your app developer and admin mm. or your application developer and admin. And so, um, you know, we're also trying to make sure that we're just being really pragmatic about serving people where they are. I think as the market starts to really adopt Power Platform as a whole and we see more customers pulling all those things together, that's how we'll follow that uh, just, again, really pragmatically forward uh, without disrupting the existing communities. Yeah. There. yeah, and maybe to add to that, like, like Power BI was 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 is very very mature, right? So there would be a lot yeah. more disruption suddenly taking a, a very large user base and taking them over to another admin experience. So frankly, we also really haven't had the ask for that as much as we've had for for a single admin center across Power right. Automate, Power Virtual Agent, Power Apps, and so forth. So right. totally. Um, hey, there's a couple questions in here about the soft motive uh, story today. It uh, turns out we we acquired a company today. So, <laughs> Chris, <laughs> you want to talk a little bit more about that in general? And uh, I know you've you've posted some links into the into the chat here, but uh, I'd love to kind of acknowledge that on the mic. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. I posted some links. So there's a really good blog post that talks about the details of the one automation uh, acquisition. Um, it is another tool that's available in kind of the RPA, Robotic Process Automation Suite um, from Power Automate. Uh, so UI flows in the desktop, UI flows web, and then win automation. Um, you can run the automations that you create in win automation. You can run those from uh, Power Automate. Um, yeah, those. there is a bunch of documentation out there at the bottom of the blog post. There's kind of links to documentation, more details. <clears throat> um, Soft Motive uh, has, uh, I think it's 18 uh, training videos uh, on their uh, website related to Win Automation that are really useful. We're still in the process of bringing that documentation over. Um, there was also an additional question uh, asking about Process Robot, which is a part of Win Automation. I am not uh, familiar with that uh, in particular, um, but we'll be uh, learning more about that in the coming months. Awesome. Um, cool. Let's get to the next one on the list here. I'm trying to go in some side of order. Uh, let's go to can the end user be prevented from having direct permission to the data source or data gateway when using their personal credentials if they know where to find direct access to the data source or data gateway? Maybe, maybe only with portals. Um, so I let me make sure I fully understand this question. If the if the scenario is um, end user knows where the data source exists but doesn't necessarily have a corporate credential to access it, how do we prevent that? Um, oh, sorry, Per. I think I just sent you live un, unintentionally here. Maybe that means you get that's to all right. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I Why that, do you figure out what the question is? That's yeah, nice. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still learning how to be a video <laughs> DJ. And a, and a, and You're a doing leader. well. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can get this going. Um, so, it, it, look, maybe this is not the right answer. I'm happy to follow up uh, offline to to the person that asked it. But um, it, it, the fundamental security concept in Power Platform is you're always acting as yourself. Um, and and you're acting in your own authenticated context and you don't get extra access to stuff just because you happen to be using Power Platform. Uh, DLP takes that a step further and it allows you to block certain connectors entirely now or segregate connectors between business data only. So an app can only use connectors in this bucket versus personal data. Um, an app uses things outside. If a user knows where the front door of an application is and has access to it, they can always navigate to the front door of that application and, and access the data source. Um, if they don't, then Power Platform doesn't get them around it in any in any particularly fancy way. 
Um, so, so hopefully that's a an, an answer, or at least was a, a you know a close understanding of the question. I'm happy to to go follow up more deeply there if there's a, a different interpretation, or maybe pair if you read that differently, feel free to chime in. No, I, I same way. And again, just to echo what I said before, we're doing a we're doing a bunch of work on the whole um, uh, issue around who's got access to which connectors and connections. Um, so, so on top of what we did with with DLP policies. Where you could say this is the, you could kind of say this is my business data and this is this is different data than, and we don't want those two um, types of data to collide. You can also now actually block um, connectors and you'd be able to block endpoints because in the past it didn't really matter. You could block a custom connector, but someone else could create a custom connector that did the exact same thing, connected to the same endpoint, and it wouldn't be blocked by your DLP. Whereas it will now because you can you'll be able to block it at, at the endpoint level instead. So we're doing a ton of ton of updates on that. Awesome. Um, OK, next question in here. Could you let us know, is there a pricing available for the whole power platform um, or should we buy apps and, and automate separately? Um, I don't see a community edition for automate. Um, so uh, there is not yet today a single true all you can eat full meal deal that gets you power apps, power BI, power automate, power virtual agents uh, and, and, and six other things. Um, that is something we are getting an increasing amount of questions about that even a few months ago was not really top of mind in practice for, for most customers. Um, so today, yes, they're sold independently. Part of the part of the advantage of that is, you know, you know, we've talked earlier about how in a lot of other uh, parts of the of the of the landscape, these are completely different businesses. They're also different markets, and they tend to be sold and bought differently, right? Uh, all, a lot of low code app platforms tend to price per app or per user, like Power Apps is priced. A lot of automation platforms tend to price uh, per per RPA bot, like uh, like Power Automate uh, RPA is priced. And so we're trying to really follow the market rather than try to shoehorn everybody into a one size fits all approach. Now that said, the closest you get to that is when you do run a, a fully premium power apps license, every automation that runs in the context of that app, like literally over the same data sources, whether it's triggered or, or actioned over the same data sources, is included in the power apps affordance for, uh, for that app. So you can combine that pretty easily and then add on to that if you need to virtual agent capacity or portal capacity or something like that, or AI builder capacity. Um, so it lets you sort of assemble the, the set of, uh, of, of uh, licenses that you need to go run a solution. Um, but uh, but there is not yet a, a fully independent, uh, you know, just uh, all, all you can eat happy meal that gets you <laughs> that gets you the whole power platform. Uh, but I but I you know said yet in that sentence, and I think honestly we want to hear from people about how realistic that is and, and what uh, what framework they would want to, to pursue that in. Um, on the power automate specific question, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, there is a community edition for Power Apps, which is really meant to be like a single developer plan. It gets you your own environment. You can tinker in, but you can't share stuff in for free. For Power Automate, there's just a free plan that you can just use for free, um, and it has certain limitations to it. Um, we don't have the same equivalent in, in Power Apps. That's why we have that kind of developer-specific uh, uh, affordance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a per user plan, uh, and then there's a per flow plan that you can yeah. look at. Uh, RPA is an additional cost. Uh, Forty dollars a month is the standard cost for that. Okay. Cool. Um, but let's not spend too much time on licensing at a developer conference. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna I, I want I want you to answer this one, Ryan, because this okay, is you you, you it, answer this one as well. <laughs> yeah. I think this one is difficult for you. Never mind. Yeah. Do you guys have any tips on how to convince my colleague to use Power Apps as a low code tool to let students of different professional fields make apps for fun? Any ideas, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've heard of this Power Apps thing. I think it's going to be big someday. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, look, I think this is a, this is a really good question. You know, how do I get somebody kind of interested and in, in turned on to Power Apps in the first place, especially people from different fields? Um, look, I, I will say um, uh, we have such an interesting diversity of people building apps in Power Apps today, um, and one of the great, uh, you know, uh, you know, greatest and most frankly fulfilling parts of this job for me is the fact that we've been able to take a whole range of people from 
literally security guards and fourth grade teachers and former bricklayers and auto glass dispatchers all the way up to very accomplished .NET developers and IT professionals um, and 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 you know in the middle everybody including mechanical engineers and drilling engineers and and chemists um, and and put them together into one giant melting pot where they can learn these tools and get productive in them and start building things and and frankly then pushing each other to go further and uh, and and do things that you know somebody from one of those backgrounds or one of those capabilities would not have been able to to do on their own um, and and that's cool across the whole community it's particularly cool when you see it happening inside an organization um, and uh, you know i brought up uh, our, our friends at schlumberger earlier in the call uh, this is a you know global energy services company. They operate in pretty much every continent on the planet. Um, they have uh, you know you know tens of thousands of humans who are not necessarily software developers, um, but have backgrounds in different forms of engineering or data analysis or material science, um, and uh, and absolutely all of them have sort of this uh, you know base capability to go be able to think through a problem analytically and and work with tools like Excel and BI to go solve it man power apps takes off in an environment like that because it it lowers just some of the friction to get in um, and tinker and puts people on more of a level playing field um, and just the amount of stuff that can be built in an organization like that uh, i mean that organization sort of privately goes and hosts internal hackathons and has thousands of people contributing globally and they build hundreds of apps in a week um, uh, just private to one company um, and and uh, you know have out of that ended up uh, you know taking just really impactful use cases that in some cases have saved the business millions of dollars and never would have been developed if it just came across a, a software professional's desk um, so so there's kind of that double effect of you know, it's not just lower the time and cost to, to, to make something and get it out there. Um, it's also just get a whole bigger range of humans tinkering and building um, and uh, and expand the community that way. So uh, look, I'm biased. Don't take it my word for it. <laughs> but uh, uh, but there's a big uh, there's a big set of opportunity there um, to to go uh, to go expand. Hey, I got another question I want to pick out of the list, and I know we're getting close to the, the top of the hour, but um, what would be the main advantage of using CDS versus another data source? Um, uh, so I have a little uh, 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 gift to uh, share here. I guess I'll share it in the in the form of a tweet, and I'll pop it into the chat with uh, with that question. But um, Power Apps gets so much bigger <laughs> with CDS used under it. Um, and it's really not just about one more feature uh, or one more advantage. Uh, uh, CDS is the entire platform that we run under our most sophisticated business app. So all of Dynamics 365, whether that's customer service or sales or our marketing capabilities or field service capabilities, now increasingly our ERP capabilities and FNO, um, that whole stack is, is part of CDS. Um, and we offer it as part of Power Apps at, at, frankly, a fraction of the cost as the finished applications that come shipped on, on top of it. Um, so it's not just another data source. It's not like you're comparing CDS with something like SQL and Azure, which is just a low level structured storage tier. Uh, CDS is many forms of storage in, in, in both structured SQL Azure and Blob and, and Cosmos DB for log files, all abstracted into one interface uh, that has a really rich security model wrapped around it that's hierarchical and role-based that then exposes a whole bunch of controls to, to go configure business logic, including writing code plugins to, to go extend it, that generates rich UI on top of those artifacts, has a whole schema already stamped out, integrates with AAD, publishes apps to iOS and Android, has rich mobile offline, has external facing portals on top of it, um, and we're just getting started, right? So there's just an incredibly rich stack there that can be configured very quickly. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, there's just so much more value than starting at some some table of data sitting in some other cloud and, and tinkering over it with low level parts. Uh, now look, both of those are valuable and in truth people are are you know 
doing both of those things together and increasingly not as seeing them as mutually exclusive options. Um, but, but when you're building on CDS, you're really building on a full and mature stack that today is supporting billions of dollars of global business in, in the Dynamics 365 space and petabytes of structured data in the cloud. Um, and you get that whole toolkit um, in a friendly purple package called called Power Apps and, and, and Power Automate. Um, so, uh, you know, there's just a lot there. Um, you know, what's been interesting about this is, uh, you know, all of this has been really pressure tested in the last two months as we have been smacked in the face with the global COVID crisis and a lot of organizations that were not traditionally quick to digitally transform were faced with no other option. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, if you go look at, um, you know, some of the work that we've done with healthcare systems, uh, you know, first here in the Northwest and now globally um, with governments uh, doing testing and antibody testing, um, just the ability to go stand up an end to end solution um, in a weekend uh, that can be rolled out to tens of millions of citizens. Uh, you know, literally the state of New York is testing thousands of people on a a uh, secure public facing web portal where I can go report my symptoms, get a QR code if I'm eligible for a test, get scheduled dynamically for a location and a time slot to show up, show up in person, show that QR code through the window of my phone, get it scanned on a mobile power app and then barcode scan match to a test kit, get all of the results automatically fed to me in a secure way with Power Automate behind the scenes to literally be able to pull that together in days at the scale that it needs to run and deploy it into a, an environment where it's it's really mission critical and frontline that just does not happen on anything other than a full stack platform like like cds um, and and that's really the only way that uh, that kind of, of of quick response has been able to happen um, uh, so other than that there's not really good reason to use cds but uh, but I, i'm a fan <laughs> um, and if you haven't checked it out yet definitely uh, definitely would encourage you to, to spend some more time with it I got to do justice for our, our our other Ryan here who was not able to join. Hopefully uh, that's a, at least a good shred of an answer. All right, what's next on the on the list? Um, will it be possible to allow deployment of solutions without the person deploying being added as owner, like setting a service account? Uh, I, I think that is supported today, Pear. Yeah, 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 yeah. indeed. Hey, that's uh, and 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 we're gonna make it and we're gonna make it we're gonna support that scenario in the build tools as well here coming up june 1st awesome mm -hmm. we're full of good things <laughs> <laughs> um is there any work to be able to support multi-factor auth in rpa flows chris do you happen to know the answer to that one i as far as I'm aware, not right now. Um, yeah, not right now. Uh, the <laughs> um, yeah, username and password is supported. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of anything specific on the on the multi-factor multi-factor authentication uh, path. Cool. No worries. Yeah. Sorry about that. No worries. Can you please explain to us the pricing of Power Apps Portal? Am I obliged to buy an instance for each instance? Um, no, uh, that's a, that's a bit recursive. So that was the old model. Um, the, the old model in the Dynamics world, I think we addressed this a bit earlier, was if you were a Dynamics customer um, of a certain size, you get one portal instance included. If you are anybody else, you have to pay a flat fee per portal per month. Uh, regardless of whether you've got two users on it or two million users on it. Um, that was not a great business for customers <laughs> because honestly, <laughs> in a product like Portal, you have a big long tail. Um, you have actually a lot of people at the lower end of the long tail overpaying. At the other end of the tail, it's not a great business for Microsoft because you have a few customers driving incredible volume and cost on that portal and still paying the same amount as somebody with a couple hundred users. Um, and so the new model is, is a little bit more equitable across that spectrum. Um, the pricing model is I, I buy a package of login 
events uh, or a package of anonymous page views. Um, and a login is really defined as any authenticated use within a 24 hour period. Um, so, you know, I log in on my phone this morning, I log in on my tablet in the afternoon, I log in on my laptop in the evening. That's still just one event for the for the day um, uh, with my with my usage account. Um, and then I, I basically buy a capacity of those over the course of the month. Um, so what's listed if you just spelunk around the public powerapps.com pricing page is a starting price of, uh, of basically 200 bucks a month for 100 logins that effectively equates to two bucks a login. Um, that's actually fairly reasonable at low volume. That gets astronomical if you're talking about, you know, thousands of people logging in a month. Um, and so if you follow some of those hot links, there's actually a, a graduated pricing structure for it. Um, so if I go up to a thousand logins, actually the price per gets cut in half. If I go higher than that, it goes down further. Um, and uh, if you're in a, in a situation where you're doing really high volume, uh, you know, give us a call and, and, uh, and we'll cut a deal on it. Uh, but basically you pay per login event um, and uh, or or if you're running an anonymous portal, um, then uh, then you're paying for anonymous page views and obviously those are a lot cheaper. All right, is there a roadmap to migrate all the Dynamics apps into the Power Platform? Your platform is much more modern and extendable and the Dynamics modules, Finance HR, are far behind in, in terms of features. Um, that's a loaded question, but Chris, given that you've just uh, come from the world of finance and operations to the world <laughs> of, uh, of Power Platform, um, uh, can I put you on the spot for that one? I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, as far as finance and operations is concerned, there's a number of things that are going on to uh, leverage the Power Platform more, allow more use of the Power Platform. We're currently adding instant flow support into the finance and operations uh, applications. Um, we are going to be creating uh, data change triggers for um, the finance and operations applications so that you can uh, create data change flows uh, in the same way that you can um, for uh, for apps based on CDS. Um, so that will allow for data change flows to be used instead of alerts. We are looking to migrate finance and operations uh, workflows to be flows uh, in the same way that the other Dynamics 365 uh, apps are. There is uh, there are there is a virtual entities support that is being added in uh, for finance and operations data entities to appear inside of CDS as virtual entities. So you'll be able to go into CDS and say, yes, I want like th these five, ten, hundred. Uh, data entities from finance and operations. I want those to appear inside of uh, inside of CDS, and then you can build apps uh, on top of those uh, data entities in CDS. Um, so you can uh, build Power Apps on top of those. They're full read write. Um, yeah, the virtual entities uh, side of things is going to open up a massive. Um, uh, open up the ability to, uh, to build uh, any kind of power apps on top of finance and operations data. It's going to be a big uh, game changer and you're going to be hearing a lot more about that in the coming months. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. And then maybe maybe just to add to that real quick, like it's not it's not going to be we don't see it as us going to migrate all the existing uh, finance apps or to the power platform. Okay. It's more a matter of using enable um, FNO users or apps if you want to use the power platform to have a low code extensibility option which you don't have today mm -hmm. so that's that's more the direction that is going mm -hmm. rather than migrating to another platform yeah imp important yeah. calls that call outs i mentioned the kind of alerts and workflow pieces those are pieces where there's a lot of synergy with power automate and getting kind of that flow extensibility so that you can on an alert you can send a text message or uh, on a workflow you can go ahead and kick that over to sap you know having that power of uh, being in a, inside of a flow with a workflow or an, an, or an alert uh, it makes more sense to kind of migrate those pieces but yes you're quite right we're not looking to migrate the whole uh, the applications as a whole uh, over to cds just providing those extensibility options Reminds me of my favorite scene in that classic film, The Princess Bride. You know, never start a land war in Asia. Never migrate a business application if you don't have to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
um, you know, our philosophy to this has been much more <laughs> expand what the platform can do and add more capabilities into what we call Power Apps, Power Platform, yep. or CDS in order to support a diversity of things running on top. Uh, there are a lot of things that the, the finance and operations platform can do that your classic CRM apps do not. And so, yes, while some of the interfaces have been modernized on the other side, there's a lot of richness and complexity in running um, a, an ERP system at planet scale um, that is that even a hoarder, you know, whole order of magnitude above, um, uh, you know, running a CRM system. And so we, you know, we don't want to just leave that behind by any means. That's a massive asset. And, and in many ways, Dynamics is far ahead of the market on bringing ERP to the cloud. Um, and so is, as part of sort of continuing to integrate these platforms and bring these capabilities together, everybody's boat gets lifted as we as we do that. It means it takes a little bit of time to do it well and not disrupt the existing customer populations on those on those platforms. Um, OK, I think we are at our time. There are a ton of other great questions in here that we did not have a chance to get to. And uh, and I think one of those questions is, will we answer those questions in some other forum? Um, so uh, that's a good one for us to take on and see what uh, what the right format for that would be, whether we can go put together a blog post or some follow up time or something like that. Um, in the meantime, don't be shy. Feel free to, to reach out to us directly. I think uh, in the session and some of our details are available. If not, you can always uh, hit me up. I'm RYCU Raiku at Microsoft or RC underscore says on Twitter, and I'll write you to the to route you to the right person inside of the, the team um, to get questions answered. We uh, we love the dialogue, and it's super useful for us to to know what's top of mind for you. So please don't be shy um, and keep those coming. Uh, but thank you, everybody. Thank you for staying up late or getting up early or whatever time zone you are in <laughs> participating in uh, uh, in this event. And uh, we'll see you next time.